What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to this gorgeous, gorgeous Tuesday, December 6th, 2022 edition of the Energy News Beat Daily Podcast. I am your host correspondent Michael Tanner coming to you from an undisclosed location here in Dallas, Texas, fresh off a three-day bender. I appreciate Stu stepping in and riding it solo today and culminated at the Sunday night football game, um, watching the Cowboys romp the Colts, one of the craziest third quarters I've ever seen in football. Um, so we appreciate Stu helping out the cause, but I am back and boy, do we have a loaded show before we get to that guys, as always, Stu is is with me. He's the executive producer and publisher of the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. How you doing, my man? Hey, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and uh, we got a stacked house tonight. I mean, I'm looking at the stories. I mean, Stu, he was saying he sends me over the stories about, you know, a couple hours before we do the show, and I felt like my phone was just going off the hook. <laughs> We've got six crazy stories we have to cover and i think you probably if you follow the markets understand we heard opec is keeping oil quotas the same stool we'll cover what that means today was also the first day of the russian oil price cap and really what this means is it's in, as Stu's going to talk about, it's probably just a subsidy to China. We have an article on that. The EU is accelerating renewable energy permitting, so we'll see what that <laughs> means. For the overall. We'll see what that means. Um, if, we're talking about heartburn. Whew. European, you know, next story we've got is European leaders are right to worry about America sucking up to the clean energy capital investment. I'm sure that's a spicy one. And then we'll finish up with two LNG stories. One at home here talking about who will actually supply the natural gas. And then overseas in Europe, Trafigular land a $3 billion loan to supply Germany with natural gas and LNG. Uh, they're going to need it. So that's good. I'll finish up with covering what happened in the oil markets today. Talk about heartburn again. Holy smoke. <laughs> gas all the way down to $5.64. I mean, Stu, there is so much to talk about. We will get to all of that. But first, guys, check us out www.energynewsbeat.com uh, in the link below. It is the best place for all your energy news. All the news you hear about, all the stories we're referencing that we're using to pull all of our notes from come from that website. It's the best place for all of your high level energy, oil and gas, political, geopolitical, how it all fits together and really gives you a good insight about how the sausage is made. All right, Stu, enough of the pleasantries. <laughs> where, where do you start this show off? Well, I want to give a shout out to uh, all of our uh, fans and everything. It, our stuff is just going nutty. And uh, uh, to all the folks that are listening around the world, we do appreciate you. Uh, Michael, it is just phenomenal on how things are going. But let's start with the first one here. Uh, OPEC keeps quotas unchanged to wait uh, uh, more market clarity. Here's the thing on this. And that is well, when you tell me what happened, what, what well, first what happened is OPEC came out in their meeting and said, we're not cutting, but we're not exactly, adding barrels. That's exactly right. And they they are just going to go off of last month's uh, two million uh, barrel per month uh, cut that they were just saying, hey, we're going to sit back and wait. They're all sitting around the table, kind of like those dogs playing poker on a velvet fence. They're kind of going, why do we care? Because uh, watch what the EU does, and it's going to be yep. even worse. So why should they do anything? There's a couple things about this. Uh, they really strategically don't need to worry about anything, because if we uh, cover that in the next uh, article, and that is if Russia pulls off 1.1 million barrels per day out of production because of the fight that is going on over the cap, they don't care. There's a million uh, barrels off of their thing. Why would they want to do it? Price goes up. They don't have to do anything. So it makes a lot of sense. They're actually very, very smart players on this. Yeah, so I mean, if, 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 if I was OPEC, why would you rock the boat? 85, 90, you make it's it's you're still funding the 11 trillion dollar. You've seen that Saudi Arabian, the 11 trillion dollar line city. I mean, that's what 85, 90 dollar oil does. So they're just happy to chill along and, and make their line. So, I mean, not that, you know, not that they maybe they'd come in and cut, but but why not? I mean. 
that you're they're still cutting oil. It's just oh. they're cutting what they say they're gonna cut. So all of I do love the the, the OPEC speak. It does get to me. Oh, it is. It's kind of nutty. Now the next one is there are uh, so many mistakes buried in the G7 agreement to put the Russian cap on oil. This article is phenomenal. Uh, it it really goes through everything in there. The G7 cap on Russian oil is a subsidy to China. There's some quotes in here, Michael, that I just flat didn't even, uh, I kind of pulled a Scooby-Doo moment or even a Scrappy-Doo because I went, <laughs> huh? Um, so when you take a look, according to uh, Reuters, uh, the G7 price cap will allow non-EU countries to continue importing seaborne Russian crude, but it will prohibit shipping insurance and reinsurance programs from handling cargoes of Russian crude. I talked about this a little bit yesterday, or this morning, actually, or last night, yesterday. I'm in a time warp on my solo show since you were out on your bender. Um, it is only a subsidy to China because uh, China is Russia only takes $20 is what their estimated cost is. So if they're selling at $60 today, why would you want to put a uh, price cap on it and make Putin mad? Uh, the G7 really wanted to, if the G7 really wanted to hurt Russia, Michael, this is a quote out of it hurt Russians finances and exports the way to encourage the way to do it is encourage higher investments and in alternative and more competitive sources. Okay. That's not actually a hundred percent true, but it goes on to say governments will continue to impose barriers to investment in energy, as well as place more regulatory wrong and burdens to make it tough to get there. So what you're hearing is this last line, adding a so-called price cap on Russian oil prices due to the increasing barriers to develop domestic resources, the G7 may be planting the seeds of a commodity super cycle where the dependence on OPEC and Russia increases instead of decreasing. Let me say that again. What I've been saying, the developed economies are taking their countries from a modest dependency on Russia to a massive dependency on Russia and China. Wow. So you're going from one to both, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think I, you're, you're kind of quiet. This is like this was a hairy article. This is a hairy article, but I think it also, I get it. Um, but, I mean, I also, th I, I just think it's very interesting. Price caps clearly don't work. As we'll cover recently, the overall markets definitely did soften a bit. I mean, we're down from 82 right. all the way down to 77. Now, is that because of Russian, the, the oil price caps? Absolutely not. So, you know, maybe part of it is, but again, I think how Russia navigates from this point is very interesting. And I think that's the scariest part that you brought up is this is not necessarily going to help anybody out economically. It's not like it's going to starve yeah. off at a recession. It's not like it's going to, you know, increase the amount of money going to, you know, some, you know, a Ukraine yeah. or some good actor versus whatever. All it's going to do is provoke Putin, who might do something crazy. And that really is is creepy, in my opinion. In, in this case, you know, uh, the bear is the, you know, always symbolizing Russia. Poking the bear is not a good thing. Now, uh, the other side of that, Putin came out and said, any country that is going to honor the $60 bear ca uh, uh, cap imposed by the G7, he is cutting oil off to them. Ooh. So, that is also a big deal because that's part of OPEC's reasoning. No. We don't, we're we're going to let our, my brother and sister fight this out. They're, they're our brothers, you know. If their siblings going on, they're just smart just to step back yeah. and kind of go, ah, eh, we don't want to do anything like that. So, um, 
this next uh, article folds right on into this. <laughs> if you heard that one part in there where I was reading that article where uh, the author says, oh, the EU, one way around this is for the EU to go more into reliable, uh, re renewable. And that's how we got here, Michael. So the EU's, this article is titled, the EU acts to accelerate renewable energy permitting mm -hmm. and unleash more repowering. There's a gigantic problem with wind going on right now in Europe. And so this article also has a, uh, a nice chart with the wind in there and uh, annual wind installations by country, who's putting them in and everything else. But this is critical. The EU's emergency regulations define wind and solar projects of overriding public interest and clarify the environmental grid. It means they're going to hand walk everything through, Michael. So you sit back and kind of go, they're going to not only print more money, which, Michael, what does that do? Creates Say inflation. Again? Yeah, they're going to print more money. That's going to make it worse. The um, supply chain is more costly for renewables because you got to buy them from China. So then you have all the shipping coming in. So this is now a major debacle. So yeah, what is it around 80 gig? What do they say here? Around 80 gigawatts of wind capacity is currently stuck in the permitting process and the to five times the total wind capacity installed in 2021. Exactly. Ooh. Now, what they're going to do, Michael, is they're going to spend all this money. The supply chains are broken. They're going to take, you know, all this kind of stuff. It is just a mess. I mean, bucks, bucks, bucks. So here's the next thing coming around the corner. So you, we got the mess. OPEC's over here going, hey, I'm going to wait. <laughs> hey. So then you have, yeah, then you have this one. Okay. So now rounding the corner, we have this article. Uh, European leaders are right to worry about America's sucking up the world's clean energy capital investment. Uh, I have talked to several folks around the world, and this is absolutely who they are mad at, at Biden. And it's because all of the countries, and this is, there is many, many countries, uh, companies around the world can't afford to even manufacture. VW is one of the most well-known. They are moving their manufacturing out of Germany because they can't even afford the energy it takes in order to make cars. So how are you going to even have a company when you can't make cars? Well, all of the additional funding that the uh, Inflation Reduction Act included in it for renewables, the world is running to the United States to get a hold of that handout and those tax subsidies, which is a good thing and a bad thing. But Europe is now sitting there going, oh, wait a minute. They're printing money. I, I, Marcon, the French you know, prime minister, how, what do you... Help me, I'm poor. Help me, yeah. And now I got to print more money. So it's like, holy smokes. You know, Biden was that, he didn't know he was in a chess match and he actually won that one. So you take a look at that. Now, this is a whirlwind thing going on around here. It is a never ending circle of just things that are all intertwined. You cannot just say supply and demand anymore. It is supply, mm -hmm. demand, political. She said, he said, anyway, this no, is I, just I, unbelievable. I, I think these, these four stories are probably some of the more interconnected stories that we've had since we started doing this show, to be honest, because they each, as you said, feed off each other. I mean, you know, OPEC choosing to not, not raise production maybe has something to do with the fact that there's a um oil uh embar or there's the 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 G7 price cap on Russia part of the per updating the permitting process is due to the fact that all this Russian oil is going off to the market and now people realize they need to invest in renewables well guess what they come to me and my tax dollars for a handout they're so, coming to the unfortunately yes. you hit the nail on the head with this one so it it now is it a bad thing for the U.S. to get all those 
um, I think that we would be smarter yes. if we read. Yes, it is. But I think we would be, <laughs> I think we'd be better off to redo our, and thank you for keeping me, you know, nice, but it, we'd be better off to redo our energy policies so that we would use fossil natural gas until we can get the energy cost down and then we could help everyone else out. Anyway, my two cents. I won't argue with that. Um, you know, <laughs> I think there's there's two other stories that I'll cover because they they they, they kind of go along with the natural gas that we're covered. But currently, in the United States, we're having a little bit of an issue here, Stu. You ran this story on Newsbeat a couple hours ago. U.S. LNG is booming. But who yep. supplies the gas? So top line here is in the current year, five developers has signed 20 long term deals to supply more than 30 million metric tons of LNG a year. Holy smokes. How many tankers is that? What's a normal tanker? Uh, I have to go back and look. dude. I don't know if they measure it in tons, but it's unbelievable. And so the real question is, do we have enough of that? And pundits are asking if the United States can ramp up production to meet that future demand. And it, you know, the, the other high level point that they point out is, you know, this article will goes on to say it's going to be a real challenge for the United States to meet that future LNG demand, especially when you talk about um, the amount of capital investment that's going to be needed. I mean, really, you know, and this is one of my quotes. I love Toby Rice. He's the CEO over at EQT Corporation, which is yep. like the largest natural gas producer in the United States. Um, and he said recently, he said in an interview, he acknowledged that the Appalachian Basin pipeline capacity has, quote, hit a wall. As a result, RBN, I don't know who those guys are. Was that, what is, what is RBN again? Who are those? Who are these research analysts? They're probably ex Goldman Sachs guys. Yeah. Um, RBN, I can't figure out their name. Oh, yeah, RBN, I think it's just RBN Energy. I think it's just all those shows, whatever. So RBN says that production growth in the base will likely only be closer to 3 BCF today, capping production at just under 38 BCF a day on an annual average, which means we will be over 15 BCF away from that when time comes. Wow. Pretty I mean, that's so much investment. Pipelines aren't cheap. They're clearly not getting permitted. No. You know, I think the, the light at the end of the tunnel that, Stu, you talk about for LNG and a, you know, a natural gas powered society. I mean, we're years away from making that happen, which is unfortunate. And we're a lot of money away from it. And the, I mean, this is a uh, tough road at, uh, coming around the corner. Yeah. Uh, when you sit there and think, uh, I was sitting there looking at it. I was going to say some numbers out here a second ago, but um, on your uh, LNG carriers, they're between 210,000 and 266,000 cubic meters. I, didn't, I have to go look and see if it's tons versus, you know, cubic meters. So uh, I don't, they're not counting the same way as typical. <laughs> you got to go figure out who's counting who. You got to go do exactly. You got to go do your own research because, you know, you don't want to ever end up uh, trusting uh, the wrong sources. And I think the other really interesting article that goes along with um, this LNG is over on the other side of the world. Trafigura, one of the largest global commodities traders, um, lands a three billion dollar loan going old school backed by the German government to help supply <laughs> Germany with natural gas and LNG. It's an old school deal, a little debt by the government. It's looking a little creepy, right? It's getting a little creepy, this interconnection. You know, when when do they, you know, not that, not that I think this is bad by any means, but um, it, it's good. Trafigure is going to supply gas to Germany's securing energy for Europe, a former Gazprom unit. Aha! So it's the Gazprom unit hey. that now they're going to start pumping full of gas um, that the country nationalized and recaptured earlier this year. No. Oh, I see what's going on. Oh, I see what's going on here. There's also a follow gas delivery under the agreement took uh, actually took place on November 1st. Trevigura said um, it would primarily use existing quantities from its global gas and LAG portfolio. OK, so they're just reshifting stuff around, but to the tune of three billion dollars. So you got to like that. Oh, yeah. There's a side note to that story. That side note is that they are. Uh, putting a price cap. Germany's looking at funding a price cap 
on electrical prices so that the consumers can try to say, you know what that's going to do? More that's, inflation. It's, just, <laughs> it's never ending, Stu. It's never ending, unfortunately. <laughs> gotta love a good government back loan in times like these. Um, you never thought it was love. good. All right. Anything else on the news front, Stu? I think we've exhausted that. I think we've exhausted these people enough. Luckily, finance is just as crazy. So buckle up. Now's your time right. to pause and do something if you need, because we're about now. Now we get to go watch oil prices tumble. If you, if you watch <laughs> and if you watch watching prices all day, we woke up to, a, you know, actually a really great move in oil and gas prices. Um, but by the time we left at the end of the day, oil had dropped from about eighty two dollars down to seventy seven thirty three. Why? Well, overall markets got pounded. SPY was down about 1.7 percentage points. NASDAQ tumbles one and a quarter or one and three quarters percentage points. Mainly due off to the fact that sentiment around rate hikes in December are going to go up. We had some fairly weak ISM November manufacturing data, but I'm not going to take that into account when I see the fall come down. Really that overall sentiment of, you know, it could be, you know, hopefully it's only a 50 basis point rate increase, but it could be 75. The uncertainty around where the Fed's going to go. Um, I don't think last week, Jerome Powell's comments, Fed, uh, Fred president really cleared anything up. He sort of said that we may look in the future to slow rate hikes. Does that mean they're going to start now or January? Who knows? So I think a lot of the sentiment around where, um, where interest rates are going is uncertain, which means it's a bearish sentiment. And that's really what I think what's lagging on oil and gas. Um, otherwise, I thought pure fundamentals um, on oil and gas still seem tight. We talk about the G7. I mean, you know, I'm going to make fun of Stu here, but, you know, we were still with this G7 price cap. Prices were going up. So the, will you, yeah. so what, what do you have to say to yourself now? I said my exact words were this could spike a very high, high price. You're talking one day. Today is the day that it started. Give it a few minutes to bake, dude. Let's talk Friday morning show. After your Goldman Sachs interview for the new oil and gas price <laughs> forecast analyst. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I had to. Uh, no, you go ahead. I'm more right than you, so I'm okay. It's, it's fair <laughs> enough. I'm working at J.P. Morgan, I guess. The ugly stepsisters, um, Deutsche Bank. Ugh. No, I, all right. I, I still am a perma bull on oil because of everything that we just said, dude. I just give well, me to the end of the week. <laughs> you eat if you eat some crow on oil on oil prices. I'm about to eat some crow on natural gas prices. We oh, are currently yeah. trading Stu five dollars and sixty four cents. I as we did record not this. see that six, one coming. Six fifty five the night before here on the fifth. Holy smokes! And 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 really the 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 estimates out there again. I'm I'm over these weather models, but they they just keep getting more and more warm, and that's driving everything down. Um, with Freeport LNG still offline, you know, production right now is over a, a hundred billion billion cubic feet a day. So with ample supply here and nowhere to really take it, I mean, it, it was a pretty big tumble. And if you notice our favorite pipeline, Waha over in West Texas, forward prices for tomorrow, Stu, trading right. it next to zero. Next no way. To zero. Be the second time in about three weeks it's happened. We covered it. You know, I think it was one of the first or second shows we did, or maybe it was a right. test show that was a wa that w when Waha. Oh right. yeah, um, when it was out. So everyone out in West Texas, it's zero dollars that they're paying for gas, which is pretty crazy. Wow. I mean, you don't go drill a well in West Texas and hope to get natural gas. So I'm, I don't think they're too upset about it, but you never know. Um, well, you know, a few companies that would. Um, but that's really what we're thinking. If you look ahead to the Thursday, um, BC, or Thursday natural gas stock um, analysts have a range of expectations between negative fifteen and negative fifty six. Last year we had an injection of of uh, or a draw of forty nine, and uh, the five year injection draw is at fifty nine billion cubic feet. So it'll be very interesting to see where that number comes in. You know, probably it's going to come on that lower side um, uh, of that draw. So somewhere around that 20 to 30, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, prices on natural gas going, at, you know, not in the wrong direction, five, $5 and 60 cents natural gas is infinitely higher than had than it's ever been in really the rest of its career. But considering where some of the fundamentals are um, 
um, you know, over the long term. I think that's what we're really fighting. I think in the long term, like you said, I think I, I feel the same way about gas as you feel about oil. In the long term, the fundamentals show it's still a buy, it's still a bull. In the short term, there are some factors and sentiment pulling it down. So, you know, even though I make fun of it, um, I, I, I feel the same way about natural gas. I, that you know, if we agreed all the time, that would not be good. Yeah, yeah. So I'm interviewing a Goldman Sachs after you, but for gas, gas analysts, <laughs> I'll be your gas reference. analyst. So, <laughs> yeah, send me a reference or just let me know what questions they asked you. Um. All right, Stu. What are we missing? That's all I've got. Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a little bit interesting. I'm trying to find out how this is going to play around, uh, and I'm hoping to have some answers in the next couple of weeks. Things are going to slow down over the holidays a little bit, but I still think the new regulations that are coming out um, are going to be just horrific. Yeah, I mean, I hope not. I hope they don't just try to cram some regulations down before the end of the uh, the end of the year. But we can hope not. But trust me, if they do, Stu and I will be covering it like a fly on manure, as my dad used to say. Um, we will be on it. Well, with that, guys, I think we'll get out of here. Let you start your day. Thank you for checking out the Alege Energy Newsbeat stand up here on this gorgeous uh, Tuesday, December 6, 2022 for Stuart Turley. I'm Michael Tanner. We will see you guys tomorrow. Today's episode of the Energy Newsbeat podcast is brought to you by Inveris. The energy industry faces massive challenges every day, and the events over the last two years have caused huge disruptions like never before. Companies in the energy industry need actionable intelligence and a single source of truth that brings all the data together. Inveris is the energy specialized technology partner that provides intelligent connections for a global energy ecosystem. Only Inveris has the analytics, people, experience, and industry scope to connect the right data and information information in the right way to discover missed opportunities and deliver fast outcomes. Find out more at Inveris.com. That's E-N-V-E-R-U-S.com.